。大家好，又到读你听二点零嘅时间，今日继续读 Agatha Christie 嘅 Sparkling Cyanide， 去到第二本书啦，去到 Book Two 啦，嘅第四节。上一节第三节咧，基本上就系呢个诶 Anthony Brown 啦，对呢个 Iris 啦。嘅求婚喎、哦，嚇、啊、有個閃婚嘅行為喎、哦，咁 Iris 呢一刻就拒絕嘅，咁但係當然啦，佢都係中意 Anthony Brown 嘅啦，已經俾佢吸引住。咁究竟呢兩個人會為咗呢一個嚇唔、啊、知點解嘅閃婚，會進行啲咩行動咧？咁啊，暫時就未有交代得好清楚啦。咁呢一節咧，就睇下有冇交代其他嘅嫌疑人啦。OK。Puffing at his pipe, Colonel Race looked speculatively at George Barton. He had known George Barton ever since the latter's boyhood. Barton's uncle had been a country neighbour of the Races. There was a difference of over twenty years between the two men. Race was over sixty, a tall, erect, military figure with sunburnt face, closely cropped iron grey hair, and shrewd dark eyes. There had never been any particular intimacy between the two men, but Barton remained to raise young George, one of the many fake figures associated with earlier days. He was thinking at this moment that he had really no idea what young George was like. On the brief occasions when they had met in later years, they had found little in common. Ray's was an out-of-door man, essentially of the empire builder type. Most of his life had been spent abroad. George was emphatically the city gentleman. Their interests were dissimilar, and when they met, it was so to exchange rather lukewarm reminiscences of the old days. After which, an embarrassed silence was apt to occur. Colonel Race was not good at small talk, and might indeed have posted as the model of a strong, silent man, so beloved by an earlier generation of novelists. Silent at this moment, he was wondering just why young George had been so insistent on this meeting. Thinking too that there was some subtle change in the man since he had last seen him a year ago, George Barton had always struck him as the essence of the stodginess, cautious, practical, and imaginative. There was, he thought, something very wrong with this fellow, jumpy as a cat. He'd already relit his cigar three times, and that wasn't like Barton at all. He took his pipe out of his mouth. Well, young George, what's the trouble? You're right, Race. It is trouble. I want your advice badly, and your help. The Colonel nodded and waited. Nearly a year ago, you were coming to dine with us in London at the Luxembourg. You had to go abroad at the last minute. Again, Race nodded. South Africa. At that dinner party, my wife died. Race stirred uncomfortably in his chair. I know. Read about it. Didn't mention it now or offer you sympathy because I didn't want to stir up things again. But I'm sorry, old man. You know that. Oh yes, yes. That's not the point. My wife was supposed to have committed suicide. Ray's fastened the keyword. His eyebrows rose. Supposed. Read these. He thrust the two letters into the other's hand. Ray's eyebrows rose still higher. Anonymous letters. Yes, and I believe them. Ray shook his head slowly. That's a dangerous thing to do. You'd be surprised how many lying, spiteful letters get written after any event that's been given any sort of publicity in the press. I know that, but these weren't written at the time. They weren't written until six months afterwards. Ray's nodded. That's the point. Who do you think wrote them? I don't know. I don't care. The point is that I believe what they say is true. My wife was murdered. Ray's laid down his pipe. He sat up a little straighter in his chair. Now, just why do you think that? Had you any suspicion at the time? Had the police? I was dazed when it happened, completely bowled over. I just accepted the verdict at the inquest. My wife had had flu, was run down. No suspicion of anything, but suicide arose. The stuff was in her handbag, you see. What was the stuff? Cyanide. I remember she took it in champagne. Yes, it seemed at the time all quite straightforward. Has she ever threatened to commit suicide? No, never. Rosemary said. George Barton loved life. Ray's nodded. He had only met George's wife once. He had thought her a singularly lovely nitwit, but certainly not a melancholic type. What about the medical evidence as to state of mind, etc.?
Rosemary's own doctor, an elderly man who has attended the Mao family since they were young children, was away on a sea voyage. His partner, a young man, attended Rosemary when she had flu. All he said, I remember, was that the type of flu about was inclined to leave serious depression. George paused and went on. It wasn't until after I got these letters that I talked with Rosemary's own doctor. I said nothing of the letters, of course, just discussed what had happened. He told me then that he was very surprised at what had happened. He would never have believed it. He said Rosemary was not at all a suicidal type. It showed, he said, how even a patient one knew well might act in a thoroughly uncharacteristic manner. Again, George paused and then went on. It was after talking to him that I realized how absolutely unconvincing to me Rosemary's suicide was. After all, I knew her very well. She was a person who was capable of violent fits of unhappiness. She could get very worked up over things, and she would, on occasions, take very rash and unconsidered action. But I have never known her in the frame of mind that wanted to get out of it all. Rays murmured in a slightly embarrassed manner. Could she have had a motive for suicide after from mere depression? Was she, I mean, definitely unhappy about anything? I. No, she was perhaps rather nervy. Avoiding looking at his friend, Ray said, "Was she at all a melodramatic person? I only saw her once, you know. But there is a type that, well, might get a kick out of attempted suicide. Usually, if they've quarrelled with someone, the rather childish motive of 'I'll make them sorry.' Rosemary and I hadn't quarrelled. No, and I must say the fact of cyanide having been used rather rules that possibility out. It's not the kind of thing you can monkey about with safely, and everybody knows it. That's another point. If by any chance Rosemary had contemplated doing away with herself, surely she'd never do it that way. Painful and ugly. An overdose of some sleeping stuff would be far more likely. I agree. Was there any evidence as to her purchasing or getting hold of the cyanide? No, but she had been staying with friends in the country, and they had taken a warp's nest one day. It was suggested that she might have taken a handful of potassium cyanide crystals then. Yes, it's not a difficult thing to get hold of. Most gardeners keep a stock of it. He paused and then said, "Let me summarize the position. There was no positive evidence as to a disposition to suicide or to any preparation for it. The whole thing was negative." But there can also have been no positive evidence pointing to murder, or the police would have got hold of it. They're quite wide awake, you know. The mere idea of murder would have seemed fantastic, but it didn't seem fantastic to you six months later. George said slowly, "I think I must have been unsatisfied all along. I think I must have been unconsciously preparing myself so that when I saw the thing written down in black and white, I accepted it without doubt." Yes, Ray's nodded. Well then, let's have it. Who do you suspect? George leaned forward, his face twitching. That's what is so terrible. If Rosemary was killed, one of those people round the table, one of our friends, must have done it. No one else came near the table. Waiters who poured out the wine. Charles, the head waiter at the Luxembourg. You know Charles. Ray assented. Everybody knew Charles. It seemed quite impossible to imagine that Charles could have deliberately poisoned a client. And the waiter who looked after us was Giuseppe. We know Giuseppe well. I've known him for years. He always looked after me there. He's a delightful, cheery little fellow. So we come to the dinner party. Who was there? Stephen Faraday, the MP. His wife, Lady Alexandra Faraday. My secretary, Ruth Lessing. A fellow called Anthony Brown. Rosemary's sister, Iris, and myself—seven in all. We should have been eight if you had come. When you dropped out, we couldn't think of anybody suitable to ask at the last minute. I see. Well, Barton, who do you think did it? George cried out, "I don't know. I tell you, I don't know. If I had any idea, all right, all right. I just thought you might have a definite suspicion. Well, it ought not to be difficult. How did you sit, starting with yourself?" I had Sandra Faraday on my right, of course. Next to her, Anthony Brown, then Rosemary, then Stephen Faraday, then Iris, then Ruth Lessing, who sat on my left. I see. And your wife had drunk champagne earlier in the evening. Yes, the glasses had been filled up several times. It it happened while the cabaret show was on. 
There was a lot of noise. It was one of those Negro shows, and we were all watching it. She slumped forward on the table just before the lights went out. She may have cried out or gasped, but nobody heard anything. The doctor said that death must have been practically instantaneous. Thank God for that. Yes, indeed. Well, Barton, on the face of it, it seems fairly obvious. You mean Stephen Faraday? Of course, he was on her right hand. Her champagne glass would be close to his left hand. Easiest thing in the world to put the stuff in as soon as the lights were lowered and general attention went to the race stage. I can't see that anybody else had anything like as good an opportunity. I know those Luxembourg tables. There's plenty of room round them. I doubt very much if anybody could have leaned across the table, for instance, without being noticed, even if the lights were down. The same thing applies to the fellow on Rosemary's left. You would have had to lean across her to put anything in her glass. There is one other possibility, but we'll take the obvious person first. Any reason why Stephen Faraday, MP, should want to do away with your wife? George said in a stifled voice. They, they had been rather close friends. If. If Rosemary had turned him down, for instance, he might have wanted revenge. Sounds highly melodramatic. That is the only motive you can suggest. Yes, said George. His face was very red. Race gave him the most fleeting of glances. Then he went on. We will examine possibility number two. One of the women. Why the women? My dear George, has it escaped your notice that in a party of seven, four women and three men, there will probably be one or two periods during the evening when three couples are dancing and one woman is sitting alone at a table. You did all dance. Oh yes, good. Now before the cabaret, can you remember who was sitting alone at any moment? George thought a minute. I think yes, Iris was odd man out last, and Ruth the time before. You don't remember when your wife drank champagne last? Let me see. She had been dancing with Brown. I remember her coming back and saying that had been pretty strenuous. He's rather a fancy dancer. She drank up the wine in her glass then. A few minutes later, they played a waltz, and she she danced with me. She knew a waltz is the only dance I'm really any good at. Faraday danced with Ruth and Lady Alexandra with Brown. Iris set out. Immediately after that, they had the cabaret. Then let's consider your wife's sister. Did she come into any money on your wife's death? George began to splutter. My dear race, don't be absurd. Iris was a mere child, a schoolgirl. I've known two schoolgirls who committed murder, but Iris, she was devoted to Rosemary. Never mind, Barton. She had opportunity. I want to know if she had motive. Your wife, I believe, was a rich woman. Where did her money go? To you? No, it went to Iris, a trust fund. He explained the position to which Ray's listened attentively. Rather a curious position: the rich sister and the poor sister. Some girls might have resented that. I'm sure Iris never did. Maybe not, but she had a motive, all right. We'll try that tack now. Who else had a motive? Nobody. Nobody at all. Rosemary had an, an enemy in the world. I'm sure. I've been looking into all that, asking questions, trying to find out. I've even taken this house near the Faradays, so as to. He stopped. Ray's took up his pipe and began to scratch at his interior. Hadn't you better tell me everything, young George? What do you mean? You're keeping something back. It sticks out a mile. You can sit there defending your wife's reputation, or you can try and find out if she was murdered or not. But if the latter matters most to you, you have to come clean. There was a silence. All right then," said George in a stifled voice. "You win. You'd reason to believe your wife had a lover, is that it? Yes. Stephen Faraday? I don't know. I swear to you, I don't know. It might have been him, or it might have been the other fellow, Brown. I couldn't make up my mind. It was hell. Tell me what you know about this Anthony Brown. Funny, I seem to have heard the name. I don't know anything about him. Nobody does. He's a good-looking, amusing sort of chap. But nobody knows the first thing about him. He's supposed to be an American, but he's got no accent to speak of. Oh well, perhaps the embassy will know something about him. You've no idea. Which? No, no, I haven't. I'll tell you, Ray. She was writing a letter. I examined the blotting paper afterwards. It was a love letter, all right, but there was no name. Ray turned his eyes away carefully. Well, that gives us a bit more to go on. Lady Alexandra, for instance, she comes into it. If her husband was having an affair with your wife, she's the kind of woman, you know, who feels things rather intensely. The quiet, deep type. It's a type that will do murder at a pinch.
We are getting on. There's Mystery Brown and Faraday and his wife and young Iris Mal. What about this other woman, Ruth Lessing? Ruth couldn't have had anything to do with it. She at least had no earthly motive. Your secretary, you say? What sort of girl is she? The dearest girl in the world. George spoke with enthusiasm. She's practically one of the family. She's my right hand. I don't know anyone I think more highly of or have more absolute faith in. You're fond of her. Said Race, watching him thoughtfully. I'm devoted to her. That girl, Race, is an absolute trump. I depend upon her in every way. She's the truest, dearest creature in the world. Race murmured something that sounded like "mm-hmm" and left the subject. There was nothing in his manner to indicate to George that he had mentally chalked down a very definite motive to the unknown Ruth Lessing. He could imagine that this dearest girl in the world might have a very decided reason for wanting the removal of Mrs. George Barton to another world. It might be a mercenary motive. She might have envisaged herself as the second Mrs. Barton. It might be that she was genuinely in love with her employer. But the motive for Rosemary's death was there. Instead, he said gently, "I suppose it's occurred to you, George, that you had a pretty good motive yourself." I, George, looked flabbergasted. Well, remember Othello and Desdemona? I see what you mean, but but it wasn't like that between me and Rosemary. I adored her, of course, but I always knew that there would be things that that I'd have to endure. Not that she wasn't fond of me. She was. She was very fond of me and sweet to me always. But of course, I'm a dull stick. No getting away from it. Not romantic, you know. Anyway, I've made up my mind when I married her that it wasn't going to be all beer and skittles. She as good as warned me. It hurt, of course, when it happened. But to suggest that I'd have to touch a hair of her head, he stopped and then went on in a different tone. Anyway, if I'd done it, why on earth should I go raking it all up? I mean, after a verdict of suicide and everything all settled and over, it would be madness. Absolutely. That's why I don't seriously suspect you, my dear fellow. If you were a successful murderer and got a couple of letters like these, you'd put them quietly in the fire and say nothing at all about it. And that brings me to what I think is the one really interesting feature of the whole thing: who wrote those letters? Huh? George looked rather startled. I haven't the least idea. The point doesn't seem to have interested you. It interests me. It's the first question I asked you. We can assume, I take it, that they weren't written by the murderer. Why should he queer his own pitch when, as you say, everything had settled down and suicide was universally accepted? Then who wrote them? Who is it who is interested in stirring the whole thing up again? Servants? Hazarded George vaguely. Possibly. If so, what servants and what do they know? Did Rosemary have a confidential maid? George shook his head. No. At the time, we had a cook, Mrs. Pound. We've still got her and a couple of maids. I think they've both left. They weren't with us very long. Well, Barton, if you want my advice, which I gather you do, I should think the matter over very carefully. On one side, there's the fact that Rosemary is dead. You can't bring her back to life, whatever you do. If the evidence for suicide isn't particularly good, neither is the evidence for murder. Let us say, for the sake of argument, that Rosemary was murdered. Do you really wish to rake up the whole thing? It may mean a lot of unpleasant publicity, a lot of washing of dirty linen in public, your wife's love affairs becoming public property. George Barton winced. He said violently, "Do you really advise me to let some swine get away with it?" That stick Faraday, with his pompous speeches and his precious career, and all the time perhaps a cowardly murderer. I only want you to be clear what it involves. I want to get at the truth. Very well. In that case, I should go to the police with these letters. They will probably be able to find out fairly easily who wrote them and if the writer knows anything. Only remember that once you've started them on a trail, you won't be able to call them off. I'm not going to the police. That's why I wanted to see you in. I'm going to set a trap for the murderer. What on earth do you mean? Listen, Race. I'm going to have a party at the Luxembourg. I want you to come. The same people: the Faradays, Anthony Brown, Ruth, Iris, myself. I've got it all worked out. What are you going to do? George gave a faint laugh. That's my secret. It would spoil it if I told anyone beforehand, even you. I want you to come with an unbiased mind and see what happens. Ray leaned forward. His voice was suddenly sharp. I don't like it, George. 
these melodramatic ideas out of books don't work. Go to the police. There's no better body of men. They know how to deal with these problems. They're professionals. Amateur shows and crime aren't advisable. That's why I want you there. You're not an amateur, my dear fellow. Because I once did work for MI5, and anyway, you propose to keep me in the dark. That's necessary. Ray shook his head. I'm sorry. I refuse. I don't like your plan, and I won't be a party to it. Give it up, George. That's a good fellow. I'm not going to give it up. I've got it all worked out. Don't be so damn obstinate. I know a bit more about these shows than you do. I don't like the idea. It won't work. It may even be dangerous. Have you thought of that? It will be dangerous for somebody, all right. Ray sighed. You don't know what you're doing. Oh well. Don't say I haven't warned you. For the last time, I beg you to give up this crack-brained idea of yours. George Barton only shook his head. 好啦，咁呢節就交代咗，係呢個 Race 啦 ，Colonel Race 啦，呢個軍人啦，同埋阿 George 嘅對話啦，嚇。咁原來咧，阿 George 咧就交代咗佢呢個計劃啦。原來就係 set 個陷阱俾呢個兇手去現身啦。咁但係呢個計劃係點咧？係始終都係唔講嘅。而呢個 Race 咧，亦都反對呢個計劃。佢認為咧。即係交俾警方做最好啦。一個咁簡單嘅章節。咁啊，我哋一齊嚟睇下呢一章有啲咩字先。第一個 ，stoginess， stoginess， dull and uninspired， lacking originality or excitement。stoginess。咁啊，呢個係阿 George 心目中對於呢、這個佢心目中對於呢個 race 嘅印象啊。佢覺得佢都係好枯燥嘅。<笑>雖然佢自己都係 strenuous strenuous 常用啦 ，requiring or using great effort or exertion strenuous 即係佢哋誒做嘅嘢好費勁啦咁樣 obstinate 嚇最尾嘅文中最尾就係阿 Ray 去批評呢個阿 George 啦，即係叫佢收手啦，你唔好咁固執啦 ，stubbornly refusing to change one's opinion or chosen course of action despite attempts to persuade one to do so。固誒食固不化啦，好頑固啦，固執啦，比較強烈啲嘅一個貶義啲嘅詞眼啦。Obstinate。OK， 咁我哋下一節再睇下故事發展係點啊。